and welcome to episode 14 of Art Snaps. Thank you for joining me wherever you are in the world. I'm Katie and I'm lucky to work at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery, which has a gorgeous collection of modern British art. So in every episode of Art Snaps, I've been exploring a few pieces from the collection whilst we're unable to visit Swindon Museum and Art Gallery during lockdown. Since it's just been Refugee Week, I got to thinking about how refugees are represented in the collection and I realised that there are a great number of artists who came to England as refugees and made significant contributions to British art history. And I'd probably say that the most well-known piece by a refugee artist in the collection is Janko Oldler's composition from 1943, which I talked about way back in episode 3 on The Bomford Gift. So I won't go into too much detail here because I don't want to be too repetitive, but I wanted to mention it because it has a really interesting story attached to it, which kind of links Swindon's art collection to the devastation of the Holocaust. And we know that Oldler had made a great reputation for himself in the Dusseldorf art scene, but had to flee Nazi persecution and eventually wound up in Oldbourne with Jimmy Bomford, who donated this piece to Swindon's collection. And if this interests you and you want to hear a bit more about this work or this story, then please do listen to episode three of Art Snaps on the Bomford Gift, which discusses composition in a bit more detail. Today I'm going to discuss work by three other Jewish artists who had to flee their homes in the 1930s during Nazi rule and found refuge in England. And these are Frank Auerbach, Lucien Freud and Lucy Ree. And the pieces we're going to talk about aren't necessarily about the experience of being a refugee in the same way that Oldler's is, but these are artists who experienced displacement and started a new life here in Britain, in London to be precise, and added great things to our cultural heritage. First I want to talk about this piece by Lucien Freud, who was born in Berlin and was one of three sons of a German Jewish mother and an Austrian Jewish father. And they moved to London in 1933 when Freud was 10 years old to escape the rise of Nazism. He's now possibly the most celebrated portrait painter of 20th century Britain, even though his unflinching realism has sometimes proved controversial. And this was certainly the case when he painted The Queen in 2001, which seemed to be loved and hated in equal measure by both critics and the public. And he was also an important member of what became known as the School of London in the 1970s, which was made up of a group of artists who committed themselves to figurative art and finding new ways of depicting the figure in paint. And this was really a time when minimalism and conceptualism were the dominant art forms in Britain. Other artists associated with the group included Francis Bacon and Howard Hodgkin, who also remain extremely important in British art. But despite the fashionable circles he moved in and the public commissions, such as the portrait of Queen Elizabeth, he was actually a very private man and mostly painted portraits of himself and his friends and family. This early portrait depicts his wife Kitty, who was known to be an anxious and shy character, and she's shown peering out from behind a fig leaf with wide and almost oversized eyes. And there's been much debate about the meaning of the fig leaf, Though Freud was always insistent that he didn't use symbolism in his work, it's difficult not to read more into this symbol of nudity and modesty, as this is what the fig leaf is traditionally associated with. But I do also think that, along with the single wide eye, it serves to enhance the psychological impact of the portrait, And I can also see how formally the fig leaf is an appropriate size and more pleasing to the eye than other leafs or forms of greenery might be. In some ways, Girl with a Fig Leaf is quite different from the thickly painted and harshly lit nude portraits that Freud is now so well known for. But as an early etching, it shows the same intensity, but with bold and precise line rather than expressive brushwork. And the etching process has allowed him to experiment with some striking mark making, which really captures the texture of her skin and her hair and her delicate eyelashes. And he's even rather beautifully captured a reflection of light in her iris. 
And all this precisely rendered detail really predicts the unflinching scrutiny of his later portraits. Now let's take a look at Frank Auerbach, who was also born in Berlin and entered Britain in 1939 at age seven under the Kinder Transport Scheme, which helped almost 10,000 children, most of whom were Jewish, to escape Nazi persecution. Sadly, his parents were left in Germany and died in Auschwitz in 1942. But here in Britain, the young Frank Auerbach thrived, going on to study at St. Martin's School of Art and then the prestigious Royal Academy in London. Like Freud, who was one of his closest friends, he's a key figurative artist associated with the School of London, which was really going against the grain of what was fashionable at the time. And it included other important painters such as Arby Kitai and Leon Kossoff. And I'm mentioning these names specifically because Kitai, Kossoff and Freud, along with the pop artist Joe Tilson, are depicted in the four etchings by Auerbach, which are owned by Swindon Museum and Art Gallery. And this is a really lovely series in the collection because we know that Auerbach only really creates images of the people he knows because he's most intrigued by the people and things which are familiar to him. So clearly he was creating a group of images showing artists that he knew and respected. And we know that he started them when he visited Joe Tilson in Somerset in 1980 and then followed with portraits of the others when he returned to London. I've chosen to talk specifically about the etching of Lucian Freud, partly because of the subject of this art snap, but also because it's interesting how, more so than the others, it reflects Arbach's painting technique, which is defined by thick layers of paint, with these layers being scraped away and built back up again over and over until he's satisfied with the image. The result is quite intense and his paintings almost seem to pulsate with the depth and texture of the paint. And there's a process of addition and reduction in the etching technique too, which involves adding wax to a metal plate and scraping the image into the wax and then exposing it to acid, which bites into the exposed metal and creates an image on the plate. And the wax is then removed and ink is applied to make the final print. And Auerbach has used this technique to achieve a similar effect to his paintings here, with that incredibly expressive layered mark making, giving the piece great depth, animation and psychological presence. Finally, we're going to talk about this piece from Swindon's collection of studio ceramics, which was created by Lucy Ree in the 1960s. Ree was born in 1902 to a Jewish family in Vienna, where she set up a studio in 1925. And over the years, she firmly established her name as a potter, exhibiting all over Europe and winning prestigious prizes, including the silver medal at the Paris International Exhibition in 1937. So unlike the other two artists we've discussed today, when she fled Nazi Austria in 1938, she wasn't a child, but was already a successful artist. So she took her potter's wheel with her and settled in London, establishing a studio in Paddington where she worked until her death in 1995. And interestingly, during the war, she wasn't able to continue with her pottery that easily. So she made ceramic buttons and jewellery to make ends meet. And during this time, she employed a number of refugees to help her, including a young man called Hans Koper, who went on to become a partner in Ree's studio. And they are now two of the most famous potters of the 20th century, with Ree receiving an OBE in 1968 and a CBE in 1981. Swindon Museum and Art Gallery is fortunate to own several of her pieces, which are characterised by their tightly controlled modern forms, which are hand thrown on the potter's wheel. And control is very important in Ree's work. And this is also exercised in her technique of raw glazing, which is a type of glaze which can be applied with a brush before the pot is fired, rather than the usual technique, which requires a pot to be fired and thus solidified in a kiln before the glaze is applied. And as I said before, recreated her work by throwing it on a potter's wheel. And in pieces like this bottle, the cylindrical base and widely flared rim would have been thrown separately and then assembled together. 
And again, we can see how much control would be needed to achieve the great symmetry and balance that we see here. And there's also that fantastic carefully scratched in decoration, which is called Scraffito, which would have required such a steady hand. And I also enjoy this particular piece because it demonstrates her great sense of colour with that deep pink standing out against the dark brown and making that Scraffito decoration feel all the more special and delicate. So that's our three pieces for this week and I hope that I've been able to begin to demonstrate the great impact that these artists who came to Britain as refugees have had on our visual culture. And as always, I want to end by reminding you that Art Snaps is brought to you by the Art on Tour project at Swindon Museum and Art Gallery, which has been working on numerous ways to make Swindon's art collection accessible during lockdown. So do take a look at our blog, www.swindonmuseumandartgallery.org.uk slash art on tour for more information about the collection via blog posts and lots of exciting family and learning resources too. Thanks again for listening and as always, do take care and stay safe. Bye for now.